in the middle of Botswana. And of course the fun has now begun because the sand is very, very thick, very slow going. We had to drop our tire pressures down, down to about uh, 1.6 in the front, maybe 1.8, 1.9 in the back. And traveling with me down there doing all the work is Paul Marsh. I'll introduce you to Paul later. This is my favorite place in all of Southern Africa. This is the Makari Kari salt pans ahead of us, no Twetri Pan, and this is my final stop on an eight day expedition to find out if it is possible to really enjoy Botswana and all it has to offer without paying the extremely high park fees. And I have proved it without doubt. This is Kubu Island. Something very sad has been happening here and as a consequence these beautiful campsites on the south side of the island are going to be closed down. People have been coming here and drawing on trees and um, making fires next to trees and killing trees and disobeying the rules and the rules are very simple. <clears throat> Please stay in the campsites that we have designated. Now they do this for a reason. This is the reason. I was chatting to the warden now. He was saying that those most commonly at fault are the South Africans and the Germans. Now, <clears throat> next time the Botswana Parks Board puts up the fees again, we all sit in South Africa and we curse and we go, oh, oh, Botswana. This is a community trust, so all the money actually goes to the commun local community. It is, after, after all, their land. But can you blame them for putting up the fees? The fact is they actually don't really want us. We come into the country with our vehicles full of fuel, full of food. We don't really spend much here, and then we leave. What do we actually leave behind? Burnt trees and graffiti on the baobabs? You can't really blame them for getting upset and putting up the fees. But this recent trip has been to try and find areas in Botswana where we don't have to stay in the parks and therefore pay those enormous fees. And what we've done is we, we came in at Subong, down at the north, down, down at the southern side, travelled up through lovely, it was quite tough going at times with the, with, the, with the sand roads, deep sand, but it's very, very exciting driving, through Mabusuhubi. And we didn't go into the Mabusuhubi reserve, we actually bypassed it and headed a little bit east. And there's some beautiful pans, quite difficult to get to, absolutely, totally remote. My travelling companion is Paul Marsh, a bit of a legend if I may say so. Paul is probably the most experienced overlander and overland vehicle builder I know. Well, what we're doing now is we've turned off the main road, the north-south north road that heads past the Mubusahubi Game Reserve and looking at the info map as well as Tracks for Africa found a narrow bush track leading to a pan called Jack's Pan. We're really in the bush. Absolutely stunning. Beauty of, of Kalahari travel. It's not necessary to go to the reserves. Yes, the reserves you will see more animals, but it's a very high price to pay, and that is you'll see other people. Here we are completely and utterly alone, and we have not yet seen anybody. Today, not another human being. It's a rare, rare thing about the Kalahari. It's just, it's just you, you, you can so easily completely get away from other people.
It is true to say that I learn something new on every expedition I go on. And this one was no different. <laughs> the first thing was how easy it is for external equipment to affect a vehicle's performance. Well, the grass isn't very high now, being winter. But if it was much higher, I'd put on the grass net. Uh, on our way here, we had an interesting experience with some um, overheating problem. It wasn't a serious overheating problem, it was just something that I noticed. This vehicle is fitted with an EGT, an exhaust gas temperature sensor, to warn me because it's an aftermarket turbocharger, to warn me if the internal temperatures in the engine around the inlet manifold and where the turbo will, will you know, the temperature will affect the, the head and the turbocharger. Um, warn me if it gets too hot so I can then easily accelerate a little bit and it cools down immediately. And I noticed something interesting and this is what we discovered. Overheating, it's often caused by us, not the vehicle. Now here's a situation now in the Kalahari, very, very flat roads doing 110. I've got an EGT measuring my exhaust gas temperature and it keeps on beeping. Yesterday we were driving up in higher ambient temperatures, up steeper hill, and it wasn't beeping. So what have I changed? I put on the number plate. Now it was off yesterday. And the reason why it was off is that I noticed that it was blocking these two orifices here. Now the way the orifices are actually shaped, the steel is shaped, it's shaped in a particular way that allows air to move swiftly into and under the engine bay. So now, if I take this off, that's now smooth. I'm now going to see if my EGTs drop. Remember, I only, I only covered it by, what, 15%, 20%, but that edge will cause such a great deal of turbulence there the air just won't go in. It'll just be rolling around here instead of getting in there and cooling the engine. Let's go and see if it works. So now, <clears throat> sitting 110, what I've been doing for the last hour is a bit of a climb, EGT, it's just, just past 600. Let's keep it at 110, see if it reckon it's that little thing with the number plate is costing us on average 60 degrees exhaust gas temperatures. 60? That's a lot. Amazing. And that's going to affect engine power, it's going to affect economy, a whole lot of other stuff. I didn't think it would be that much. Amazing. Now just thinking again about the, the you know, I've seen people drive uh, on the open road even towing a caravan and they've put a grill net a grass net yeah completely I mean it's, it's I don't think people are actually un, unaware of what it's doing to the engine because unless you've got that gauge you won't really know what's happening inside now imagine the engine at full power pulling a caravan high ambient temperature and you're putting an enormous blanket in front of the radiator We know from driving actually that the grass is quite long in the middle here and what tends to happen with grass it gets sucked into the radiator and hangs in to the cores of the radiator here, and that's going to block the radiator up eventually. Of course that's going to be bad for cooling and once those seeds get wet they're really difficult to get out of the radiator core. What I've got is a radiator seed net. It's tough. It's a nice strong one. It's made from seed net uh, shade cloth and we will clip it in two places. Very quick and easy under the bottom here to give a bit of tension, back up over the top, again very similarly around the bottom, back up over the top and that's taking me less than 30 seconds. Now if something like this becomes a mission to put on and off you're not going to use it. Equally once I get onto the busy road I want to remove this because I need good airflow through here. Are we going slowly along the track here? Perfect. 
it'll, re it'll reflect most of the seed nests and I'm quite happy it's going to do its job. Okay, this particular one is made by SecureTech and they make a big one and a small one. Don't buy the small one, it doesn't, doesn't. Make sure it goes as far underneath as possible. I would actually prefer that to go even further underneath, but it's not quite big enough. And I had to modify this. So don't think you can buy one from the shop and it'll fit your car. You gotta, I added some clips and I did a few modifications to make it fit my vehicle. One, fit, one model doesn't fit all, that's really what I'm trying to say. I was in a convoy well, in Angola. One of the vehicles was a Land Cruiser 105, same engine as this with the turbocharger. Okay. And he was complaining terribly that the inside floor was very, very hot. I had the same car. I was having no such problem. And we discussed it, and after a while somebody said, and that wasn't me, and it should have been because I should have thought of it at the time, he had very large spotlights. And somebody said to him, just maybe, maybe it's something take that off. take them off. Solves the problem completely. I'm at a place called Matzla Ting, and I was here in 2000 with my family and uh, I was f shooting my very first TV series. Matzla Teng is further northwest, along remote sandy roads toward the western woodlands. No designated campsites, no fences, just wild, remote Kalahari. And it was on this pan that my, my middle daughter Erin got absolutely covered in mud, and then we had to rig a shower at the back of the vehicle and, uh, and clean her up. I was driving a Mercedes Galunderwagen, my first one, uh, all that time ago, 13 years ago, and this is the first time I've been back since then. Paul and I have come to Botswana to shoot a web a series one, called Overland yeah. Workshop. Yeah, do I have the knowledge I need to go on this trip? We sit and discuss various overland and off-road topics, such as water, survival, which spares to carry, cooking, security, handling border posts, and a whole lot more. We're talking overlanding. The series can be downloaded now at 4xoverland.com. Right, what I'm going to talk to you now about is canopies. I don't have one. One of the topics, fuel contamination, actually became a problem while we were talking about it. So it was not just a matter of theories, but we had a problem and we needed to solve it. <coughs> okay, a very interesting thing is happening right now <coughs> as we're driving. We've just left Kansi. We put 90 litres of fuel in the back tank. We want to get to the Makati Kari. We want to be as light as possible. We do need a reasonable amount of fuel. We decided let's Fill up the front tank, leave that alone, back tank enough to get to the pans. By the time we get there, we will be empty. Now, the car is running terribly. I'm sitting at 100 kilometers an hour. It won't go any faster. My EGT, exhaust gas temperatures, are sitting and hovering just under 600 degrees. Now, normally, they should be sitting at 400 degrees at, in this configuration. So we've got a problem. We've got a mechanical problem. Now the obvious thing is to think, okay, well, why, the car was behaving beautifully yesterday. What have we done, even this morning? What have we done? We've put in fuel. So it has to be fuel. Yeah, well, we've got two options now. So because we found that the problem is giving us this kind of like jerking sensation while we're driving. Yeah. So it's almost like the vehicle's not getting enough fuel. So what we've got is we've got a particle buildup. So junk from the Bowser, from their tanks, have actually so now you, gone into our fuel tank. So you think this is contamination? Well, there's two, or, or, two, or, two or things. Or oh, there's fuel contamination. Now some of these, these, these garages have very old tanks. And these old tanks either have water condensation inside the tank, they don't always clean the tanks out often enough, right? or in very rare cases, they go and they mix paraffin with the diesel to bulk it up. So what you do is you get in, you fill your car up, you hope that you've got the best fuel. Normally I would say check the fuel before you put it up, but I wouldn't expect it in a town like Hansi. It's, it's, uh, it's a big it's place. It's a big town. And you they, know, they, they and there's a high turn, turnover turn fuel. Over fuel. Mm. So all I can think of, one of two things. We either got the dregs of the Bowser, and their so tank is low, so, so we've, we've got, got a, a particle. Filter. Got a filter, our filter slowly blocking up. I think that the fact that the EGTs are picking up shows us that the fuel that's going into the engine is not actually enough 
uh, not enough quantity quality. Or no, not quantity. No, quality. Quality. Yes. Quality. Okay. Because okay. okay. quality, quality is actually, in my mind, is showing me that the quality of fuel being burnt at the moment yeah. is not producing the power we need to stay and sustain the 100 kilometers an hour. Now you are driving at 100 kilometers an hour, but the fuel going through is not making a nice, good burn, giving yeah. nice power. Okay. So the components of the engine are heating up. So it'd be very interesting for us to actually remove the fuel filter. Mm which is always my first line of defense. The filter here has actually got a drain on the side of it and I'm going to just drain a bit of fuel into this little cup I've cut off a coke bottle and if we can see any problems with the fuel that we take out the filter it may save us changing the filter. I'm either looking for contaminants or something that's, that's dirty in the fuel. Like normally you just crack this little butterfly at the bottom of the filter and it should run out the, the hole of the butterfly. The diesel I've got out is actually dribbling out, so I actually think that the filter might be blocked. I can't see if contaminants, but for sure I want to change the filter because I want a nice firm spurt of diesel out of that. Okay, drain what plug. what tools do we need to? Uh, <coughs> need <coughs> you need Allen keys. Yes, I need Allen keys. Okay, my big toolbox is buried. We can get it, but I have to take out quite a bit of stuff to get to it. Okay. Okay, we have a little bit of a problem. <coughs> the uh, fuel filter was from my previous Land Cruiser, which had exactly the same engine, different filter. This is a newer filter. So uh, the spare part that we've been carrying all this time doesn't fit. So we have to try and find one at, uh, at one of the towns. So now what I'm doing is brought it into Bailey's Off-Road and Johannesburg. Johannesburg is on my way home. Um, and uh, of course he does carry all the spares so he's going to just quickly replace the proper filter for me but what we did to keep the vehicle running because it got worse and worse and worse we bought a couple of those and we just took the pipes off the, the, the standard filter and put this in line we of course made sure that the size was correct for the piping and we put that in and um, kept going now I want to try and determine what was in the fuel that caused us the problem. The fuel station in Gunsey was a large one. It wasn't as if we were pumping out of barrels. So we didn't think to put any special filters on it. So we just literally just filled up the tank. That doesn't... <coughs> but does it stop cleaning? All well, that is not... Paraffin. Well, we know that water. They, we know that they do that um, across our borders for sure. <laughs> yeah, well, we lost a lot of power. It, it didn't actually stop it. See the it dirt, lost a lot of power. You see how you've got to wait for this to settle, uh -huh. and then you see your see your dirt line coming there. Ah. Uh -huh. We'll shift it like if it was gold. How's that? Yeah. Uh, sure you see now you see how dirty it is there. And you compare a new filter next to it. Put the new filter next Let to it. In the so section. would you say it was? high level of dirt rather than contamination is that what you would suggest? I say it's just more dirt, fine dirt particles. But I mean if we just open up the little filter you put in yeah and we can see what's inside there and yeah. to your dirt when you're in. Mm. This is mm. Conclusion reached. It was just pure dirty fuel probably not contaminant but so tell what these things are. You can't eliminate the, the fact that they might have been contaminated. Well, you think fancy, because the thing about fancy, I mean, they, they, they can't, shouldn't be that dirty. No, they're because they're turning over they're fuel. turning over fuel. And it was a, yeah. Mm. Oh. But exactly what we thought. That's why we thought it was more likely but to be... But also the same old story, you know. Who else has had problems when they filled up a fancy? <laughs> that you don't know of. Absolutely. And maybe we were the last people on the last day before the tanker before the arrived tank. and we got this much you at the, the bottom of the tank. You got the bottom of the tank. Yeah. Right, now I want to talk about stoves. And while I'm going to do it, I'm going to show off. This is my current favorite product. It's called an MSR Reactor. And it is a water boiler. This will boil water very, very quickly. Okay, so I prefer, and see how long that takes, I prefer small stoves and I, and I want to be able to choose where I cook. 
It gives you a lot of versatility. I mean, we could be cooking in the back of the car, but actually it's really I, nice outside here. I, I've, yeah, that's right. That's why I, I don't really particularly like, you know, cookers built into trailers or built into sure, setups. Sure. I also find that often you've got a, a group of people and you, you'll find the women are gathering around the food and the men are gathering around the fire. And I'm kind of saying, well, why is that necessary if the stoves can be moved closer to the fire, there can be one group and everybody cooking together as opposed to separating. That's just the yeah, way no, I... No, it's great. It's, the it way it I works really well. And if you wanted to get out of the wind or in some shelter, it, you can move it. Yeah. I like the fact that they pack up small. You know, oh, they look small ones, yeah. These ones yeah. are small. And most yeah. people don't use a lot of gas anyway yeah. for their trips. Yeah. Eight days we've used, what, we've well, used we've, one of those. We've used one of those and eight, we just opened the second one in eight okay. days, two so, of us. That's actually very, yeah. very good. You, yeah. You'd be surprised how little gas you really use. Yeah. Um, the big heavy ones, um, you know, prefer these. There you go. There, what did I tell you? There you go. Boiling. Oh, it's a treat in the morning. Hey, isn't that quick? And, and I make the coffee. That is that. That is good. It's a cool toy. <laughs> <laughs> we saw lots of animals. We saw wildebeest, um, uh, red hartebeest, zebra, um, lots and lots of cory bustards. So there is game. And chemsbok, a lot of chemsbok and springbok. So you can see the game out of the parks. Then we had headed north, up to the western woodlands. Not too much game, beautiful drive, such an exquisite area of, of woodlands. The campsite was idyllic. Absol again, absolutely alone, nobody around. Headed further up north, and then we took the trail near Charles Hill, which is near the border of Namibia, heading east along the Okwa River. Now I'd seen that in the map for several years and thought, oh, I wonder what that's like. It was a little disappointing really, quite nice, but a little disappointing. Our previous campsites had actually been much nicer. I'm now <laughs> having a wonderful moment of reminiscing. In, um, in 2010, I did an expedition and that was to follow the, the, the course of the, the great Okavango River, went right up into um, uh, Angola, found the source of the Okavango and then followed it, and followed for over 60 days and eventually event ended up here. And this is the Nabe River. And I explained how the Nabe and the Boteti spill, you know, that drain the water from the Okavango. Amazing story. And, it, and I remember this bridge and the, the water was much higher than this. What a lovely, lovely scene this is. So we then we went to Hansi, stocked up in supplies, up to Maun, east to Gweta, and then from Gweta, now south to Kubu. All in all, the only part, only camping fees that we've actually been required to pay has been here at Kubu. So about eight nights, less than 400 pula. Now, I've got one more place to go. Our last stop on this trip are the South Islands. My previous two attempts to reach it failed. Hopefully this time, third time lucky.